A lot of us think that, gee, if we work really hard on ourselves, we'll reach this point of blissful enlightenment <laughs> where we need nothing from anyone else. And, you know, I have two letters for that, which you can guess what they might be. And so that is absolutely not true. Most of us come from families that were, let's say, less, less than perfect. And it's left us with a little bit of insecurity, you know, and then we move into the world, the world batters us around a little bit more insecurity. And what that means is that we continue to need a little bit of reassurance that we're lovable, that we're worthy. I've never met somebody who actually had surpassed their need for compliment. Julie and John, welcome back. Thank you so Thank much. You. We're happy to be here. So great to see you both. So great to have you back on the show. You are living legends in the relationship space, arguably the world's leading experts. Uh, so always great to see you and fantastic to see another book from you. This one titled The Love Prescription, which I really enjoyed. So great to see you. Thank you so much. That's a, a very generous introduction. <laughs> Thank you. You have earned it. And, you know, I think we last spoke about a year and a half ago, and I, I'm curious, a lot's changed in the world. Uh, what's changed in your life since then? Ah, oh, good question. Well, we did have a grandson. So uh, some people get a puppy during COVID. We got a grandson and uh, it's been fantastic. So we're in ecstasy most of the time. We're, we're in love. <laughs> right. It's he's really great, been fun. He's a great little boy. Uh, congratulations. Congratulations. And I'm curious in terms of the relationship space, uh, what's changed in, in terms of one, the challenges that, that couples face. Yeah, you know, what seems to be the case is that uh, during COVID, when people especially were quarantining, the good relationships actually got much better because people had more time together to really celebrate being together. But the folks who were beginning uh, the, that period of time with some distress got much worse. Uh, and as we've heard in the news, there's lots more mental health problems, depression, there's more suicidality. Uh, and we're sadly seeing the same thing in couples' relationships where um, uh, people are trying to find their way in a very different world. They don't necessarily have the tools to connect with one another and move through that journey together. And it's causing more conflict uh, and more pain and even more breakup. More domestic violence. Right, yeah. Sad. Right, it is. So in terms of the mental health epidemic, I, I, that, that's something that is very concerning to me. The world's got a lot of issues, but that one really sticks out. And I think about the lack of IRL meaningful connection and to me, that conversation uh, is one that we that we really need to get front and center in the health and wellness conversation. You know, let's say let's say we're you know practicing yoga, we're eating vegetables, we're meditating, we're doing all the right things, but if if you're lacking that connection, kind of negates all that good stuff. And I think you know something I, I came across in the book, which I thought was so powerful. Uh, you talk about the power of touch, and and I like the way you framed it up. It's not what you think. So can, can we spend a moment on the power of touch? Because I think this also transcends romantic relationships. You want to? No, go ahead. You, you okay. talk about it. Well, there was a, there's a fabulous researcher in Florida. She has been studying touch for, I don't know, 40 years. And what she has found, similar to what we found, is that touch is as essential to our well-being as food, water, exercise. Uh, touch is so important to us that 
uh, in studies done, you know, decades ago, when children in orphanages were not picked up and held, they had a much greater tendency to actually die, mm -hmm. uh, which is stunning. They got food. They were kept dry. They were kept warm. They died anyway. And they called it back then failure to thrive. But actually, what it turned out to be was the lack of touch. And if you think about it, Jason, we're pack animals, right? We really depend on each other in order to survive. And part of that uh, connection that we need for our survival is touch. Touch releases oxytocin, which we've heard lots about, the hormone of bonding, but it doesn't have to be sexual touch. It can be just, you know, a touch on the arm, a touch on the shoulder. Um, Holding hands. If you have a really cute husband, <laughs> a, a pat on the head. Um, it can be, you know, whatever it is. Um, but touch makes a gigantic difference in relationship. Yeah. In fact, uh, there were these classic studies uh, done uh, at the University of Wisconsin, where I went to graduate school, by Harry Harlow, where they had a, a baby baby monkeys, rhesus monkeys, either had a cloth mother that provided contact comfort, or a mother that was a wire mother that just provided milk. And psychoanalysts and behaviorists have said the only connection to the mother is because she provides milk. And it turned out when the baby was frightened, it went right to the cloth mother. It wanted touch and contact comfort, not to the wire mother. So there's a basic drive in all mammals for a connection and touch is a part of that. Well, what's so interesting to me is this, this concept of, of mini touch. You know, it doesn't have to be this, this grand gesture, if you will, of this long embracing, a uh, warm hug that just doesn't seem to end. It, it can be mini touch. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way of saying it. <laughs> and so what, what I love so much about your work and specifically this book is, you know, I think in terms of relationships, we tend to think of these these big moments, these big gestures. And the reality is it's it's the everyday, it's the mundane, it's these little moments. Uh, so, so can you talk a bit about some of those little things that we can do on a daily basis in order to maintain that connection with our partner? Yeah, one of the most powerful things that we discovered in our apartment lab was that people are always reaching out for connection. They're making bids for conversation, for touch, for affection, for all kinds of things quite often. And the reaction of the partner is so critical. And the couples who wound up, the newlywed couples who wound up divorced seven years after the wedding, when we look back on how they behaved in the apartment lab, they had only turned toward their partner's bids for connection 33% of the time. Whereas the couples who were still married prior six years ago had turned toward those bids 86% of the time. So these small moments are very, very powerful. Can you walk us through, for those familiar with your work, we know what you're talking about when you, when you mentioned bids for connection, but for those unfamiliar, can you walk us through that? Yeah, let me uh, give you an example. Um, John and I can just role play. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we always like doing it. Hey, honey, look, uh, look at that bird. Is that a blue jay? That's called turning away when you give no response at all. Try it again. Hey, honey, look at that that, that bird. Is that, is that a blue jay? Honey, would you stop interrupting me? I'm trying to read. That is turning against. Let's try it again. Hey, honey, look, look at that. Is that a blue jay? Wow, sure looks like it. Yeah. Boom. That's turning towards. That's all it takes. Right. How long did that response take? I would guess a second. And that makes all the difference in the quality of friendship, 
the quality of passion and romance in the relationship, as well as conflict. Conflict goes much more smoothly and easily when each partner feels like the other person has really been, for the most part, turning towards them when they make a bid for connection. And a bid for connection can just be, uh, like John was doing, just a, a request for shared interest, right? right. Or l listen to this newspaper story. Or it can be uh, something a little bit bigger, like, gosh, I really need help uh, tonight with picking up the kids from school. Could you help? A little bigger need. All the way to, honey, I'm feeling really depressed. I'm feeling really sad. Mm -hmm. I, I really need more of your attention to talk tonight. Mm -hmm. And that's a bigger need. All of those we call bids for connection. They can be tiny, they can be big, but the important thing is the tiny ones are just as important to keep fulfilling as the big ones. And that's, that's the number one hack. That's yeah. the number one hack. When John says the successful couples turn towards each other 86% of the time, but the unsuccessful couples, you know, years down the road, only turn towards each other 33, 33% of the time versus 86% of the time. And a lot of those kids were little tiny things like, would you pass me the butter, <laughs> you know? So little tiny moments like that make a huge difference. My, my graduate student, Jenny Driver, discovered that when you have high level of turning toward, when there's a disagreement, when there's a conflict, People have much more access to their sense of humor. They can laugh at themselves. And it reduces physiological arousal at shared humor. So you get so much by this turning toward idea. It's so fascinating. And I'm curious, does, does that graph, if you will, change over the course of a relationship? In other words, do some relationships start out strong there and then weaken over time? Or do some start out? We, it, it, what, what are your odds of success if you're starting out from a, uh, a low percentage, if you will? Does that get better? What have you seen? Yeah, let, let me answer that because uh, my colleague, uh, Robert Levinson at UC Berkeley, actually studied couples uh, from their 40s all the way through through their 80s. Oh, my and gosh. things get better and better over time. And that's the good news is that when a relationship is working well, over time, your partner's turning toward you becomes even more precious to you. It doesn't erode, you know, it doesn't go away. It becomes better and better and more and more important to you. And, and something else that it seems like a, a little one, but in the book, you you clearly lay out why it's so powerful, I thought was, was interesting. Compliments. Uh -huh, yeah. Compliments yeah. are lovely. You know, one of the things, Jason, in um, the wellness field in general is that a lot of us think that, gee, if we work really hard on ourselves, we'll reach this point of blissful enlightenment <laughs> where we need nothing from anyone else. And you know, I have two letters for that, which you can guess what they might be. And so that is absolutely not true. It's just not true. Most of us come from families that were, let's say, less, less than perfect. And it's left us with a little bit of insecurity, you know, and then we move into the world, the world batters us around a little bit more insecurity. And what that means is that we continue to need a little bit of reassurance that we're lovable, that we're worthy, that we're enough for our partners. We're smart enough. We're pretty or we're handsome enough. We're funny enough, you know, whatever it is. And we may be able to take in compliments to the point where they soak in so deeply we never need another one. <laughs> but I've never met somebody who 
actually had surpassed their need for compliments. Not even Donald Trump. <laughs> he needs compliments too all the time. And so, <clears throat> yeah. So we do too. Well, the, you know, there was a great study by these two women, Robinson and Price, and they put observers in couples' homes for an evening, just counting the number of positive things that happened between them. And they found that uh, in unhappy relationships, people stop noticing these positive things. 50% of them go by without being detected by the couple. So that when you, when you say thank you, when you pay a compliment to your partner, you're building this culture of appreciation in the relationship that is such a cushion for, you know, dealing with the world's everyday stresses. Just very powerful. Well, let's talk about that for, for a moment. What, what's the proper ratio in terms of our interactions with our, with, our, with our partner in terms of positive versus negative? Is it five to one? Is it 10 to one? Is it even? <laughs> well, during conflict itself, it's five positives for every one negative. But for a non-conflict time, it's 20 to one. Right. 20 positive comments or responses to one negative one. And I think the reason is that, and if you look at your own experience, you'll realize this too, that negative comments or negative interactions have much more power uh, than positive ones. Uh, the negative ones really stick to us like flypaper. They, they, uh, soak down into our minds and we keep thinking of them, ruminating on them oftentimes. The thing about positive compliments is that some of us have a little bit of a hard time letting them soak in. Mm. They feel good, but, you know, just for a moment and then we'll think to ourselves, yes, but, you know, but my mother said, you know, I wasn't funny. So he must, uh, this partner must be wrong when he says I'm funny. So, you know, it's, it's that kind of sometimes struggle that's going on internally. Um, the other thing too, that I really wanted to mention, Jason, that's important is that a lot of people think that, yeah, compliments are really necessary in the beginning of a relationship when you're being courted, right? You uh, don't know your partner very well. You don't know how they feel. And you want to hear that your partner thinks positively about you. But later on, when people still need compliments, Sometimes a partner will respond by saying, what do you need compliments for? I told you I loved you. I told you that on our wedding day. It's, you know, 30 years now. What, what do you need to hear? It's just. <laughs> I'll let you know if things have changed. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, not true. We were, we're not immature, which is one of the criticisms laid on people who want compliments. We're not too needy. Everybody needs a little taste of reassurance. Can I give you an example? Yeah. So yesterday <laughs> morning, Julie said, how are you doing? And my knee was hurting me. My back was hurting me. And I said, I really feel like an old man today. And she said, I don't see an old man. I see this sexy, handsome man in the sort of next sweater. I love that sweater. And it made my day. Just that one thing. Yeah, it really did. And really. guess what I'm wearing today? Same the sweater. same sexy black sweater. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And how, how, how many years have you been married now? Uh, 35. Wow. Congratulations. So is that your, on a personal level, what, is that your secret sauce? Is it the sweater? Is it the... <laughs> Yeah, clearly that's that's all. All the research isn't true. <laughs> the sweater, no, 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 no. We try to practice all this stuff uh, as much as we can, and of course, we're in the same soup as everybody else. We make mistakes. We get critical sometimes. We forget to turn towards each other, or we're so overwhelmed with our own comings and goings in the day that we won't turn towards each other. You know, so we also have to really stay conscious, stay aware of those necessary dynamics 
that keep our relationship strong and healthy. Yeah. So you, you mentioned family and that families are often less than perfect. And I think about ancestral trauma and the role our families, our parents, grandparents, and so on impact our relationships. And I'm curious your take, uh, how, how, how does that really impact our ability to have a successful, loving relationship? Mm. Well, it can impact our relationships quite deeply. Um, a couple of things. One, uh, there is something called multi-generational trauma. So, for example, I have met many people with an Irish background who uh, whose families never talked about their own legacy, never talked about immigrating from Ireland when maybe 1850s, something like that, 1840s. They never talked about it. Grandparents never talked. Parents never talked. And yet the the kids who are now adults will sense a great sadness and a lot of anger, it will come up, it will manifest in their current relationship and they have no idea why mm -hmm. um, until we begin to talk about, quote unquote, the great famine in the 1840s in Ireland when Britain took all the food that Ireland was raising for itself and its own army, depriving the Irish of all the food they needed to survive, leading to one third of the population dying from starvation, yeah. right? There's a trauma for you. So have they talked about it? No. And so when traumas aren't talked about, they're passed down, they're passed down, mm -hmm. generation to generation to generation. If they are talked about fully, then the traumas don't have the same impact. You know, that's what we've seen. So um, it's really important to consider what your family history is. And the other piece of this is when you grow up in a family that is less than healthy, uh, as a little one, you typically will be role modeling after the parents. So you're seeing how they handle relationships, good or bad, and that that uh, way of doing relationships is absorbed into your bones so that when you grow older and start relating, you find yourself talking the way your mother did or the way your father did. Well, on the flip side, if one is self-aware too, you know, I'll use myself as an example. So my, my parents got divorced when I was two. And so I, I really have no memory of my parents being together. And for me, what that ended up looking like is I, I, I really wanted to make sure when I got married, it was going to stick. Uh, and so I'm sure I made a lot of mistakes in relationships growing up in my 20s and so on. And that's a whole other, you know, we don't have enough time in the show. But at the highest level, I, I you know, I, I was going to wait until I got married because I knew I didn't want to get divorced. Um, and so... I would use me as an example in a situation where one grew up in terms of romantic relationships, didn't really have a, a role model or, or a model to look at. And maybe there's someone who's, you know, parents were married, but it was a disaster. They, they, they fought all the time. That could go one of two ways. One, they could repeat the pattern, enter in the same relationship. Or two, they could say, my parents are miserable. I want to make sure when I get married or when I find my partner, I'm going to do it right. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to go down this path. So I'm curious, what determines people's success here or, or, or failure, if you will? I don't want to hate to use failure, but what, what determines their, their outcome? Well, I think you're really putting your finger on it, Jason, that awareness is mm -hmm. super important. So awareness of the unhealthy dynamics that you may have grown up with or the lack of any relationship at all and knowing, first of all, that that's not going to work for you. That isn't what you want. But the second thing, which is also very important, is knowing what the alternatives are. Mm -hmm. So that's why John and I have been writing these books and doing the research and, you know, talking to people to give people alternatives 
as to, okay, I'm not going to do this, but what am I going to do instead? And having learned from those 3,000 couples we studied, we know what the alternatives are that can work successfully. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to write about. And so where do most relationships go awry? Interesting question because, you know, we know that in courtship, we're not looking for somebody who's just like us. We're looking for somebody who's really interesting and really different than we are. And then they go wrong when after they get together and are in a committed relationship, they try to turn that person into them <laughs> and they become critical for the differences. Instead of being enriched by the differences or laughing about the differences and accepting them, they try to really turn that other person into them. And that's where they make a really big mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. I, I would also say uh, that um, gridlock conflict is a big place where relationships go awry. Let me describe what that is. Uh, gridlock conflict typically is a big conflict arising when people have different personalities and different lifestyle preferences. When they try to talk about it, they argue about something on the surface of that conflict rather than going much deeper mm -hmm. to understand the other person's essential point of view about this, why they have that point of view, what is the history that's informed that point of view, what's the ideal dream in there regarding their point of view. So one has to go really deep. And let me give you an example. I know a couple uh, who, where the fellow grew up in mm, pretty upper class home in a European country. The woman uh, grew up in the U.S., but uh, sort of in an upper middle class family that actually was falling apart inside. She left that family wanting to be more bohemian wanting to not value material things, uh, wanting to live amongst, you know, the working class, basically. That's what she valued. He, on the other hand, really valued living very, not super luxuriously, but with more luxury. So here they come, they want to buy a house. Now, what are they going to look for? He wants a nice big house. He wants a little bitty house because that's more fitting to her values. His values are different. So how are they going to resolve this? They're going to fight and fight and fight, you see, until they get down to the upper, you know, to the lower levels of what's it mean to live a simpler bohemian life mm -hmm. to one partner? And what's it mean to have much more comfort and even luxury to the other partner. Why are those things important? Mm -hmm. So if we're creating that the Gottman's hierarchy of relationship needs, is, is values at the foundation? Is that a non-negotiable if we're creating that pyramid? Uh, no. Uh, first of all, we have a hierarchy. Um, hierarchies sometimes you know, let's let's just think of it as essential ingredients. So one of the essential ingredients is not that you have to have the same values, not at all, but rather you're able to talk about those values with each other and understand each other's uh, value system enough that you can try to support each other living mm -hmm. out those values and reaching a compromise when the values intersect and conflict, trying to reach a compromise. Let me also add that another uh, answer to your question, another pathway through which relationships fail is when they're, they just neglect the relationship entirely. And we've seen in, in the Sloan a center study at UCLA, dual career couples with young children quite often just focus on career and focus on children and really ignore the relationship. So for these couples that were in that study, 
their relationship had sort of devolved to a, a very long to-do list. And that's what they talked about with each other. But they weren't really nurturing the relationship. Uh, they weren't really being romantic. They spent less than 10% of an evening in the same room in the house. So <laughs> they really neglected the relationship. That's another pathway through, through which relationships die. Well, on segue, you mentioned the importance of date night in the book. Right. Yeah. That's for sure. Um, you know, when people have young children, um, they really love those kids, and those kids need a lot of attention. They need a lot of structure. They need a lot of attention, a lot mm -hmm. of love from both parents. Uh, and by the time, especially parents who are working, complete all of the attention, the needs of the children at night, they want to fall down and collapse, right? And watch some kind of mindless TV. John and I do that. We watch uh, British murder mysteries where really rich aristocrats get killed and stuff. So anyway, um, so uh, it's crucial that couples, first of all, on a daily basis, try to, in the evening or whenever they can, have a download time where, you know, they may talk about the highs and lows of their day, mm -hmm. even if it's 10 minutes or 20 minutes, something. So you stay on the same page. And then what's even better is once a week, or if you have to, once every two weeks, go out, just the two of you, and spend that time not sitting in parallel watching a movie, but instead facing one another, talking to one another, what's on your heart, what's on your mind, mm. and going a little deeper into that lovely connection that brought you together in the first place. And on that note, in that conversation, can you talk about, the, I think it's important to kind of drill down here in terms of you're not going through your to-do list. You're, you're not, this idea of planning for the future. You know, what, what is our life together? How, how do we, you know, is it talking about, hey, this is the next vacation we want to go on? Or, you know, what, what are you hoping to accomplish? Like, how, can you walk us through that, sort of that deeper, more meaningful conversation to, to help someone get through maybe the, the, the mundane chit-chat that they're used to having? Uh, sure. We, well, for one thing, we have uh, a wonderful card deck uh, that we give away for free from the Gottman Institute uh, called uh, Open Ended Questions. And each card or, you know, little screen on your computer has uh, an open ended question for the two of you to address. And it might be something having to do with the future, but it might also be something like, um, what characteristics would you like our child to inherit from your side of the family? And or, why? And what's the story of and that? And what's yeah. the story of that? Yeah. Or, you know, you grew up in this kind of family, me in that kind of family. What do we want to take? from our family into our own marital or relationship culture? And what do we want to leave behind? How do we want to celebrate major holidays? Do we want to create our own rituals? Or do we want to integrate into those rituals some of the things that we grew up with? You know, there's, and why? You know, there's, there's all kinds of questions that you can discuss as well as talking about what should we do on our next vacation, which happens to be my favorite question of all time. <laughs> well, those sound like great questions one should ask in the beginning of a relationship. Well, yes and no. Here's why, Jason. Oh, wait. Oh, I'm intrigued now. Please. <laughs> okay. Well, this will totally make sense to you uh, when you just think about it. So, yes, you do ask those questions in the beginning for sure. But then what happens is do you remain stagnant? No, you do not. You change over time. You evolve over time. You're influenced by the world that you live in right? 
most of us have changed as a result of COVID. Many of us have reprioritized mm -hmm. what's important in our lives right. and maybe what's less important. So you want to address those questions repeatedly over time because you are changing. Thus, your answers are going to change too. Let me let me say that uh, your uh, your listeners can get these card decks for free at the App Store if you type into the search function Gottman card decks. You can download it to your iPhone or smartphone and have these fourteen different card decks. And included in that are things like building a love map of your partner's erotic world, asking a hundred questions of your partner. Uh, about what they what turns them on sexually and what turns them off, and another card deck is expressing your needs for the week. What do you need from one another this week? And selecting three cards from the card deck that you need, so they can get this for free. It's been downloaded three hundred fifty thousand times so far. Well, we will definitely link to that in the show notes. And now that you're you're turning up the heat on the conversation, let, let's let's go there. How, how does one, you know, obviously everyone should go go to the show notes, do, download the deck. But how does one begin to have that conversation about what their partner really desires in terms of their sexual relationship? <laughs> you know what's interesting is that uh, Americans, you know, we may think we're really liberal and you know progressive and just so aware and conscious. We're terrified of talking about the S word, <laughs> sex. People won't talk about it. Sometimes when a couple is sitting in front of me, they'll be saying stuff and I have no idea what they're talking about. You know, it was it was nice, right? Well, it was it was okay. What do you mean it was okay? Well, it could have been a little bit better. Why? What could have been better? <laughs> I have no idea what they're talking about. Are they talking about the dessert they ate last night or, you know, the wine? I mean, who knows? We're very shy. We're shy. Again, yeah. the sex. So how do you start a conversation about sex? First of all, you, you prep yourself, prep yourself in another room privately by saying nipples, breasts, clitoris, penis, vagina, you know, all those sexual Get words ready. that, you know, we're, we're uncomfortable saying out loud. Then you go to your partner and you say, honey, do you think we could have a conversation about our sex life? How would you feel about having a, just talking about it a little bit, seeing how it's going for each of us? If you're too scared to say sex, say intimate life. They'll know immediately what you're talking about. Um, and your partner might say, well, yeah, I guess so. Uh, and you say, well, when would be a good time to talk about it? Sunday morning. Okay, let's talk about it Sunday morning. Here comes Sunday morning and you say, so listen, how are you feeling happy about our sex life? Are there things that you would like uh, from me in terms of how I arouse you or touch you that would be different? Are there ways you'd like me to initiate sex that would be different for you? What would feel really fulfilling for you? What would feel gratifying? So that's one of a hundred questions you can ask. And so these, it's important to have the conversations. People who can talk about their sex life have a better sex life. Right. On that note, you've said love isn't enough. And so what role does sex play here? You know, if we're looking to make, I think everyone's looking to make their love last forever. Um, what, what role does sex play? You know, I think it really varies, Jason, between couples. Um, some couples, you know, say we're not getting enough sex. It's only three times a day, <laughs> right? And other couples may say, you know, sex maybe, I don't know, once a month, maybe once every six months, that, that's enough for me. So it's going to vary in terms of its importance. Now, what's really important here is how does each partner hear the other person's sexual needs 
And what do they do with those sexual needs, right? So you're going to have a little bit of trouble if one person only wants sex once every six months and the other wants it once a day. How's that couple going to make it work? Well, there's different alternatives. Uh, the person who doesn't want to have sex more than once every six months, well, how would they feel about giving the other partner a hand job or even just lying next to the person if they're masturbating? Or how do they feel about cunnilingus or fellatio uh, as opposed to intercourse? What does sex actually mean? Can sex mean just making out on the couch? What is important about the daily sex? For example, um, I don't know if you've seen this, Jason, but I've seen a lot of men who feel um, ashamed of asking for non-erotic touch. They feel like it's not manly to ask for cuddles or for hugs. Let's just cuddle on the couch. That, that is somehow too weak. They need to be more dominant or something than that. And so when they need touch, they'll ask for sex instead of hugging. Well, that was, that was my next question. Do you think that some of that desire for sex is misdirected? Uh, or, or really symbolic of, of something else, whether it's touch or connection, and it just uh, is articulated as sex. But in reality, there's there's a, a need for something else. Is it, is it always sex is equal sex, or is there something else the person maybe desires? You know, I think some of the time it's what somebody desires that's different. For example, um, if they've had a bad fight. You've probably heard of, you know, apology sex. So, yeah. Makeup. So makeup sex, right? So they want to have sex after uh, having a big fight. Well, what's that about? What is that about? <laughs> you know, what I've heard from my, my lovely, beautiful couples is that um, when they've had a big fight, they feel really distant from one another. And the distance creates fear. It creates insecurity. It creates anxiety. Well, sex is one of the ways couples feel united with the other. They feel close, tender, um, really loved by the other. So they go for the big, you know, the big bucks, basically. Um, but what they may actually be needing is either verbal reassurance or some kind of touch reassurance that, do you still love me after this terrible fight we just had? Now, let me mention that uh, the largest study done on this question was recently done uh, and resulted in a book called The Normal Bar, which is uh, a terrible title. But what they were doing is they studied 70,000 people in 24 different countries asking this one question, what's different? about people who say they have a great sex life and people who say they have an awful sex life. And what they discovered was that people who have a great sex life give compliments. They, they have a weekly romantic date. They hold hands even in public. They touch one another. They give surprise romantic gifts. They say, I love you every day and mean it. They cuddle. They cuddle. So of, of the couples that didn't cuddle in all those countries, 96% of them had an awful sex life. Only 4% of the non-cuddlers had a great sex life. So cuddling is very important. And most of the things that they discovered that mattered didn't have anything to do with what happened in the bedroom. It was all about affection and emotional connection that really mattered. Fascinating. And so you just rattled off another study. And, and one of the things I love about the both of you is you're a rattle. You have so many studies at your disposal, whether you've conducted them personally or you've, they've come across your desk. And with that said, I'm curious, is there one that, that just really stands out over the course of your career that was, that was a wow moment for you? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think the, the big thing for me was that when People started designing couples therapies in the 1970s. They just assumed that 
if people were in an unhappy marriage, they weren't being very nice to each other. You know, they and they needed to really increase the amount of love there. And this study discovered that it wasn't the case. In fact, in an unhappy marriage, people are missing 50% of what's already there that's positive. Mm-hmm. They just have this habit of mind where they're only noticing what's wrong. And they're missing 50% of all the wonderful moments that happen in an ordinary evening. Mm -hmm. And so if you change people's perception, the relationship can change very dramatically. Mm -hmm. That kind of knocked me for a loop. I was very surprised by that. (laughs) Yeah. And I think for me, um, a book that I read a while back, but I remember when I read it, it blew me away. Uh, was a book by Shirley Glass called Not Just Friends. And it was a book um, based on her clinical experience with couples who had affairs. And what she realized was that sexual affairs were not about sex. They weren't about sex. They were more about loneliness, great, great loneliness in the relationship and a a a loss of emotional connection that drove people to feel completely alone and then to start comparing their partner to the really sweet, friendly barista who always gave them a fabulous smile and a really good latte. And they started, you know, approaching that person more and more and eventually talking about their own marriage or relationship, complaining about it. The other person really listened, was really there, was empathetic. And eventually that wound up being uh, either an emotional affair or a sexual affair. So, you know, affairs, a lot of us think, a lot of people do think that it's about somebody else being really sexy and really attractive, more attractive than they are. But that isn't true. A lot of times the affair partners are not more sexy, not more attractive. They're just really good at listening to the emotions of the person who seeks them out. Interesting. So I I know you guys have to run. So in closing, what's one thing we should all do starting today to ensure that our love is everlasting? (laughs) Well, I think, you know, let's come full circle. Um, Turning towards your partner. If your partner calls your name saying, yeah, (laughs) instead of not saying anything, something really simple that you can do every day is just be aware of your partner's bids for connection and try to respond to those in an affirmative way. And notice what your partner is doing right instead of paying attention to what your partner is doing wrong. And then say thank you. Say thank you. Thank you, Jason. We've really enjoyed talking. (laughs) Well, on that note, thank you both. Again, always an honor and a pleasure. And and everyone, please pick up the love prescription and definitely check out the app. We'll leave it in the show notes. But always an honor and a pleasure. Uh, John, Julie, thank you so much. Jason, thanks. It's been a great time together.